Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Good morning. We want to welcome you to our worship this morning. If you're visiting with us, I know we have some visitors. We're glad you're here. Uh, make yourself at home. Hope you come back. And if you have some questions, just find one of us that look like we might know something, you know, and ask us. And we do have Bible classes following worship for all ages, so you're sure welcome for that. Let's all stand as we praise God this morning. <clears throat> there is beyond the azure blue a God created in <clears throat> hand. <clears throat> he tinted his skies with heavenly hue and framed the worlds with his great might. There is a God, he is alive. In him we live and we survive. From dust our God created man. He is our God, the great I am. Our God, who sun upon a tree, a lot was willing there to give that he from sin might set man free and evermore with him could live. There is a God, he is alive, in him we live and we survive. From dust our God created man, he is our God, the great I am. We place you on the highest place, for you are the great high priest. We place you high above all else, all else, and we come to you and worship at your feet. We place you on the highest place for you are the great high priest we place you high above all else all else and we come to you and worship at your feet and we come to you and worship at your feet you see it please let's pray Father, we bow to offer our thanks to you this morning for your love for us, all that you've done for us, Father. We're mindful of those things in our lives that uh, you've touched us with, Father, and we're grateful. Thank you for all the relationships that are built with one another here in this place. We're thankful we can gather together like this and strengthen those. Father, for those that are not able to be here, we pray for them this morning. Pray that you'll give them a good day, a blessed day. We pray, Father, that uh, we continue to reach out to others that might not know you and 
and offer encouragement to them that they might want to know you, that they might want to be here, Father. Father, so many things come to mind as we enter into a season where we really celebrate what you've done for us. For the fact that you allowed your son to go to that cross and take on the sins of the world. Realizing, Father, that we have put him there in all honesty. And we're, Father, and we're grateful, Father, that you're willing to forgive us of all of those times that we failed you. Created a new slate for us, Father. Help us to accept that. Help us to take, embrace that and, and not dwell on our past mistakes. But, Father, look forward to our future opportunities to serve. Father, we pray that you'll be with Charles this morning as he brings us a lesson. Father, we're so grateful for his family, for being here with us, working with us. We pray that you continue to watch over each and every one here in this congregation. Father, help us all work together to, for a common good. Father, uh, just thank you for your love, for your mercy, your, gui your guidance, your kindness toward us. Just all these things, Father, they just... They just overwhelm us, Father, when we stop and think about it. Thank you for, a, again, a beautiful day. We pray that you'll continue to watch over us each and every one. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. As Tommy just prayed about the cross, we're going to sing a song in preparation for our Lord's Supper as we think back to that great gift that uh, God gave us his son and his son willingly going to the cross. We'll sing in Christ alone. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. Firm through the stone, this solid ground. Firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are, <clears throat> when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand, in Christ alone, who took on flesh, Fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross that Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin. On him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me from life's first cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny no power of hell no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand.
This day is often referred to as Palm Sunday. This is the first day of the week before Christ entered Jerusalem uh, where he would be crucified for our sins. The book of John, chapter 12, says this. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took the branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done these signs. The folks in that crowd were very likely the same ones who a few days from then would be shouting, crucify him. One day they're shouting, Hosanna! And a few days later, crucify him. What a fickle people. If you look up the word fickle, it says erratic changeableness. I'm afraid that I suffer from that sometimes. Now, we may not scream out, crucify him, but our sin does. We gather each week at the table and we think about the sacrifice that Jesus made and we resolve, yeah, we're going we're gonna to be closer to him. We're going to change some things. We're going to look at our life and follow cl- more closely. And then we get fickle and drift off and do those things that we don't want to do. Paul knows something about that, right? He talks about how he does the things he hates to do. And we change. We're a fickle people. I'm so thankful that our Savior is not like that. There's a beautiful verse, the the song, How Deep the Father's Love, is one of my favorite songs. And the second verse of that song says, Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. We're just like them. We're just like them. Our sin held him to that cross. And it's it's just that frustration of, you know, failure, wanting to do one thing and doing the other. But I'm so thankful that our Savior is not like that. He is unchangeable. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. So as we gather around the table... Let's come as we are invited every week to a Savior whose love never diminishes, whose invitation is always open, and whose grace is overflowing. Let's pray together. Father, we are so thankful that our Savior and our sacrifice is unchangeable. His love for us never diminishes. We are always welcome at this table Because we are washed clean with his blood. Father, we take this bread just now. And it represents his physical body that he put on. To come and live like us. Like his own creation. Father, we are so thankful for that blessing. And we are thankful for the wonderful gift of forgiveness. That even though we stray, we are fickle. We are changeable. That you are not. That our Savior is not that your gift is not. In Jesus' name, amen.
Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for the firm foundation that we have in Jesus Christ. We know that if we rest in him, Father, uh, we cannot be moved. We place all our faith in him. We thank you for his blood that cleanses us of our sin. He is our foundation. We thank you for that wonderful blessing. In his name we pray. Amen. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this opportunity that you've given us to gather around this table. Heavenly Father, we pray that uh, as we prepare to give back a portion of what you've given us, that um, we each realize that there's nothing we could ever do to repay you, Father. Heavenly Father, everything we have is because of you, and only because of you. Every good and perfect gift comes from you, Father. So as we prepare to give back, help us to do so with a joy in our heart remembering that all things come through you. For it's through your Son's holy name we pray. Amen.
If you would, let's stand before we sing this song. We stand to sing this song before Charles brings us the lesson this morning. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Souls in danger look above, Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea, billows his will obey. He your savior wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Be seated, please. This morning's Bible reading will be Isaiah 5, verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Woe who put darkness for light and life for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Good morning. It is good to be here this morning. Appreciate Perry for leading us as we've joined our voices to praise God I also appreciate Ricky for reading scripture this morning. Um, he snuck in beside me there, and I looked at him, and I said, are you reading scripture? He said, no. He said, I'm coming early to repent. And I said, there's a lot of us that have been praying for that moment for a long time. So, so then he read scripture and sat down. So there you go. <clears throat> Many of you may have noticed that last week I had... I had my sport coat button, and someone, well, two or three said, uh, did you get a new suit, or, you know, are you, are, was that a fitted suit? Well, I will tell you, the reason I don't button my sport coats is because they don't really button anymore, for one, but, but last week, I, I, Don Berger could, can, could share this, but I, I took a little spill out there, and, and it looked like I was trying to dive into second base. And from right here to right here, my shirt was green. Now, it worked out great because it was uh, St. Patrick's Day last week. Uh, but that's why I had my suit buttons. I guess people notice when there's something out of place. I was like, well, I didn't think anyone would notice, and I buttoned it so you wouldn't see the green. But there you go. So let's talk uh, from our passage in uh, 1 Corinthians 13. We're going to share again uh, another thought that Paul gives the early church there in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 8, at least the beginning of 8. And uh, you're going to notice that today our passage is, love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. As a matter of fact, Paul says, beginning in verse 4, love suffers long. Now notice the list. Kind of pay attention here. And, and, and as I read this, see how you have measured up as we've talked about these over the last few weeks. But uh, love, love uh, suffers long and is kind. It does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not easily provoked. Now, my New King James Version from our sermon last week says, thinks no evil. 
And we talked about how literally it means keeps no record of wrong. And the idea is when you think about the wrong, you're actually thinking of the evil. Thinks no evil. Verse 6, does not rejoice in iniquity or does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Then the first part of verse 8, love never fails. Now as you have read through that with me and as you've thought about the last, the past few weeks, you know, how, how do you measure up? This is talking about our family life in the church. You know, how, how do we measure up to that with our family life in the church? And I, I will tell you personally that if I'm looking at, at how I stack up against those, I'm afraid that I have failed miserably. Now, the beautiful thing about all of this is that we will do better, right? That we will be what God intended for us as a spiritual family to be, as the church And that we will try to do the best that we can. But as we think today about love does not rejoice in iniquity, I'm afraid we are living in one of the most challenging times as we struggle with this very thing. I think it's on every corner. It's on every newspaper. It's on every show. I cannot tell you how many... How many times I have heard recently, now you just can't watch any show today without dot, dot, dot. You fill in the blank. And and it's it's just becoming a part of everyday life. We see it. It's pushed on us. It's pushed in our schools in some regard. And so what do we do with this? Well, what we have to do is realize who we are and that we are different. The church is different. and, And we don't rejoice in... Our, a family setting with unrighteousness that's, that might possibly be a part of our church family. We don't rejoice in that. But at the same time, we don't rejoice in what the world is rejoicing in as well. I think maybe to help set our minds for this particular lesson, if you'll go back to Exodus 32 with me for a moment. And there's an interesting scenario in Exodus 32. Now, you remember that God's people, uh, they have obviously uh, experienced a a lot at this time. Um, They have become God's people. I will take you, God says, I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And think about how God declares that that they are His covenant people. And think about what His covenant people have witnessed for just a moment. And that's kind of where we are in Exodus 32. They've they've experienced the plagues. They've seen the miraculous hand of God work. Right? So they've seen that. They have um, watched the seas part and crossed the Red Sea into freedom. They have seen God work in a miraculous way with helping them and feeding them and caring for them so that all of their needs are met. And yet they come to this moment in Exodus 32. God's people who were to be different, who are covenant people, who have seen God's hand at work and have seen them God deliver them. You would think that this people to use a word that Daniel has already used this morning, would not be fickle. But they are. In Exodus 32, God calls Moses to come up and to speak with him on the mountain. And so Moses does it. And while they are up there, Moses and the Lord, you might remember in verse 7 of Exodus 32, And the Lord said to Moses, Get down, for your people whom you've brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Now, Moses hadn't been gone long, and the people start to worship and do things that are not consistent with God's people. Not consistent with being the covenant people of God. And and, and so you would think that these people would just be 
waiting. Here's our great leader and he's talking with our great God and, and we're excited to be God's wonderful people. But while they're up there, God says, listen, they've corrupted themselves, verse 7. Verse 8, they have turned aside quickly of the way which I commanded them. They, they didn't listen to my word. I, I had given my word to them, I've, I've made them my people, and, and quickly they have left me. Now, think about this for just a moment, and really think about your life, and I'll think about mine. But he said, they have made for themselves a molded calf, worshipped it, and sacrificed to it, and said, this is your God, O Israel that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now, what I think is happening is I think they have borrowed some of the mentality of Egypt where they left and brought that over in and, and created a false god that they could worship. And God's saying, Moses, look at what's going on. These people, they've turned aside to me. They've made themselves a god. They've even given the credit for their freedom to this thing that they've made. Now, think about that for just a moment. He said, this is your God, O Israel, that, this is the last part of verse 8, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord God said to Moses, I have seen this people, and indeed it is a stick-necked, a stick -necked, stiff-necked, a stubborn, uh, a very uh, angry people. Verse 10, he says, now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and I will make of you a great nation. Now, now in verses 11 and following, Moses is processing all of this, right? Moses loves the people. He doesn't want God's wrath to burn hot against the people. He doesn't want God to condemn or destroy the people. As a matter of fact, Moses in verse 11 pleads with God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with, my, with a mighty hand? And why should the Egyptians speak and say he brought them out? And for what purpose? Basically to just kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from uh, this harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens and all this land and I have spoken, uh, that I have spoken of and I give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to, the, to his people. And then, of course, what happens? Moses goes down and then he starts to, to meet with Aaron and he starts to talk about what the people have done. In verse 18, in this text, but he said, in verse 18, it is, it is not the noise of the shout of victory nor the noise of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing I hear. So it was as soon as he came near to the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing. And so Moses' anger became hot, just like God's, as a matter of fact. And he cast the tables out of his hand and broke them uh, at the foot of the mountain. Doesn't that sound a little bit like what our Lord did when he walked into the temple one day? And then he took the calf which they had made, he burned it into fire, and he ground it into powder, and he scattered it on the water and made the children of Israel drink from it. And Moses said to Aaron, what did this people do to you that you have brought such great sin upon them? Verse 22, Aaron said to Moses, do not let the anger of my Lord become hot. You know the people that they are set on evil, for they said to me, let it, uh, they said to me, make us gods that we should, that should go before us. And as for this, Moses, as for this, Moses, the man whom God brought us, uh, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we did not know what had become of him. They thought maybe Moses had died on the mountain. And I said to them, whatever has any gold, let them break it off so that they gave it to me and they cast it in the fire and this calf just came out. Now think about that for a moment. Not only has he done some wicked, now he's lying about what he's done. Verse 25, 
Now when Moses saw that the people were unrestrained, for Aaron had not restrained them to their shame among their enemies, then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever's on the Lord's side, come to me. And the rest of the story is that those who did not, God destroyed that day 3,000 people. And so I've just got a simple question as we kind of ponder that for a moment for us to think about. Who do you think loved the people more? Aaron or Moses? I mean, I mean, Aaron is telling Moses, Moses, you know, I did what the people ask. You know, they're bent on evil, and so they wanted this, and we just kind of, we, we, we caved in, I caved in, and I gave in, and I did what they asked. Who loved them more, Moses or Aaron? Because Moses... In verse 11 and following, after God says, listen, look at the people. You've got to go down there. My wrath is burning hot, and I'm going I'm to let my wrath be poured out on them. And what does Moses do? He pleads. He pleads for repentance. He, he, he's asking for God to just hold off a little while. Let him go down and try to, in some way, rectify the situation. Let him figure out what's going on and how he might help his people. Who loved the people more? The one who gave them what they wanted? Or the one who said, listen, God, don't let this happen to them. Let me try to work with them and show them that we're a different people, that there is a different way, and you are a mighty God. And let's never let it be in the minds of the Egyptians that you've brought the people out of Egypt just to kill them right here. And so Moses pleads, who loved the people of God more? I think that's where Paul is in 1 Corinthians. I think the whole reason he writes this letter is because he sees what's going on in the church and he writes a very stern letter in some regard. He talks about what's going on and he talks about their sin and he talks about how in chapter 5 some of them have embraced some immorality. And so what's Moses, uh, what's uh, Paul's plea? Paul's plea is let's be different, let's change He's pleading with the people. As a matter of fact, in 2 Corinthians, he talks about that very thing, about how he didn't write the letter to make them feel bad or make that one person that he seemed to be pointing out to feel bad. No, he didn't do it for that person, but he did want them to feel bad so that their sin would would crush them in a sense and bring them to their knees and they would come back to the Lord. And he said so, Godly sorrow, that's what produces repentance. That's what I was desiring. I didn't want to just make people feel bad. I wanted us to understand that salvation through Jesus is greater. And and so Paul says right here in verse 6, the beginning, love does not rejoice in iniquity or unrighteousness or sin. That's not what God's people do. What, What love does is... Love rejoices in truth. That's what he's going to talk about uh, next. But I want you to think about this. Love does not delight in sin. It does not. As a matter of fact, this this is our um, last knot, if you will. Right? We've we've had, you know, love is patient, love is kind, and and then, then we get into these love. This is not what love is. And the reason for that is because that's what they were doing and he's saying that's not love. And so then you get to this last one and he wants to kind of drive home this point that what love is, is love is full of truth. Who is truth? You remember Pilate had Jesus right before him and he said, what is truth? And and Pilate had no concept of the fact that truth was literally standing right before him. You might understand how truth needs to become a part of who we are. It needs to become the fabric of our being. But again, love does not rejoice in sin. Aaron said, well, let us have a party for unrighteousness. It appeared that some in the church at Corinth were having a party for unrighteousness. Moses said, well, what God's people do is they don't party with sin... They don't in any way accept it, embrace it, make it a part of who they are as a family. No, no, it was not jealous, it was not bragging, it was not proud, it was not rude, uh, it was not selfish. 
not easily provoked. It didn't keep a record of wrongs or think evil. It did not rejoice in sin, in any act of unrighteousness. And so he says, I don't want my people to be like that. That's what God was saying in Exodus 32. That's what Moses went down and said to the people. And again, I, I've shared this sermon, uh, it's been some time ago, about the 3,000 that died there in Exodus 32. And if you look at the timing, it's around the time of what we would recognize from the Old Testament uh, uh, celebration of Pentecost. And I want you to think about that. We'll get to that at the end of the lesson, but just think about how 3,000 people died who were embracing unrighteousness. Love finds no pleasure in doing wrong, in supporting those who do wrong, or in trying to embrace a lifestyle that is wrong. The passage that Ricky read a few moments ago in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, let this be a reminder, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. That's not what God's people do. And Isaiah, many years after Moses, was telling God's people almost the same message. And what's Paul doing many years after Isaiah? Saying almost the same message. And what are we doing many years after the Apostle Paul? We're sharing almost the same message. Love does not encourage others to sin. Love's not excited about wanting to sin. It doesn't embrace uh, those that sin. Again, the illustration in Exodus 32 is a beautiful one here because it, it reminds us that we just don't give in to what the people say, to what the people think. It, you know, there, there was a movement, and it's been probably 20 or 30 years ago, not, not like what you're thinking currently of community church, but there was a community church mu movement, and behind the, the movement itself was um, a, a group of people thought, well, we're going to start planting some churches, and in the communities where we want to plant these churches, what we want to do is we want to see what they want for religion. And so what they would do is they would send out a questionnaire and they would poll the people of the community where they wanted to plant the church, and they would ask them, you know, what do you want? What do you want uh, for a belief system? What do you want for uh, a religious worship service? What do you want for uh, how we would function and structure ourselves as a church? And they would get this poll, they would get these, these responses back, and they would look at the percentages and the higher percentages. They would say, okay, now let's make a church just like this. This is what the people want. And so let's just make a church exactly like what the people want. And I will tell you that that mindset is very prevalent today. And I'm not here to criticize churches. That's not my responsibility or job. My, my job is to preach the truth. But I will tell you, it should never be about what we want. Amen? It, it should be about what the Lord wants. It's, it's His church. Uh, these people belong to Him. And I'm not trying to, to, to say that some people are going and some people are not. No, that's, that's, not, that's not what I'm doing here. I, I want you to understand, though, that this thing belongs to Him. And, and in Corinth, they had sort of kind of taken the mentality... And they have kind of taken what the church poll is deeming as important. And some of it involves sin. And Paul comes in and says, no, that's not what we're going to do. But that's exactly what, what uh, Aaron did. Aaron just kind of polled the people, what do you want? Well, here's what we want. Okay, let's do it. And then let's have a party for it. This is not what God intended. Love does not only hate sin and doesn't participate in sin, but it doesn't spread it. Proverbs 10, verse 12, hatred serves up strife, but love covers all sin. We should be a people who want, who want sins covered, not, not participating in it, not, not embracing it, not enjoying the lifestyle of it. It does not promote sin as a lifestyle. And there's a little, I, want, I want to say something about this. There, there's a difference. 
I think we get caught up in how we say, how we use words at times. For, for example, how, how many of us in here are sinners? Well, that's all of us, yeah? All sin and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. That, that is a truth. And, and, and it looks like we've embraced that truth. That, that there are moments, uh, as Daniel uh, mentioned this morning, where we do things that we know we shouldn't be doing. We say things we know we shouldn't be saying. And those are in moments of weakness. And like Paul, Paul said, the good I know I should be doing, I don't do that. And the good I know that uh, I should be doing sometimes, uh, or the good I know I shouldn't be, or the bad I know I shouldn't be doing, sometimes that's what I find myself doing. And, and so, so I get it. We struggle. We're all sinners. It, it is one thing, though, to be a sinner to acknowledge that we're sinners, but that doesn't mean that we just embrace people who have a lifestyle of sin. Like, like we have a lifestyle of trying to walk in the light as He is in the light, and we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all of our sin. That implies that God's people will sin, and, and that the blood of Jesus will cleanse us from that sin. But what we're not going to do is embrace a lifestyle of sin. When someone says, yeah, we're all sinners, and so you're just like me, and, and, and so you have to accept me and my lifestyle. No, that's, that's totally different. It's one thing to acknowledge that, yes, we do sin. It's a totally different thing to acknowledge that we're going to embrace a lifestyle of sin because we're all sinners. Two totally different things. And I think that we have to understand that. And that's what the church, early church was struggling with. As a matter of fact, uh, this particular idea that love does not participate in sin was part of what Paul is writing the church at, in, in Galatia. In Galatians chapter 2, about verse 10, what you have is you have a scenario where, you know, when Peter would uh, uh, be there with the Gentile brethren... He would sit down and he would worship with them and he would fellowship with them. But then when some came from Jerusalem uh, who were Jewish and, and they would come to the church, well, Peter would ignore the Gentile brethren and he would just totally be with the Jewish brethren. As a matter of fact, Paul calls him out for that. He says, you, you can't act like that. You're, you're being a hypocrite. Here's the Apostle Paul calling the Apostle Peter a hypocrite for what he's doing in the church. He says, this is not how we function in the church. We don't cater to one group because they're Jewish and only show our favoritism toward uh, the Gentile group when the Jews are not here. He says, we don't do that. No, no, we're all the same. At the foot of the cross, the playing field is level. And I will tell you in the church that, that we can't ignore people because of the color of their skin? We can't ignore people because they happen to have a different political view than, than we do? No, in the church, there are all kinds of people in the church. And, and, and we have to be on a level playing field. We have to understand that if you are in the body of Christ, then you are just like everyone else who's in the body of Christ. And we can't let our favoritism or our racism or our prejudices get in the way of the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen? And that was what was happening. So, so it, this, this, this idea of embracing sin kind of plays itself out into a lot of different ways, not just the ways that are big and that we say, okay, I'm not going to support that lifestyle, but then we'll turn around and do other things that are lifestyle as well. We have to make sure that we're doing what we need to be doing. But I want you to understand, I don't want to leave this on a negative note because that, obviously there were some things that Paul was addressing when he says, listen, love doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness. And it was a negative side of the church at Corinth. But, but I want you to understand that we can rejoice, that, that God wants us to be a people who rejoice. We're supposed to be known for our rejoicing. When people see you and they know that you're a part of the body uh, of Christ at Washington Street, I want them to see a person that they know as a rejoicer. As a matter of fact, doesn't the Bible say in the shortest verse of the Greek New Testament, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, rejoice evermore. Now, 
we, in our English versions, it's Luke 11, I mean, it's John eleven thirty five, 35, right? Uh, those words, John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. But the shortest verse in the Greek New Testament, rejoice evermore, rejoice always. Paul, over and over and over in the Philippian letter, had to tell people to rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. He would have to tell them, let your joy be made known to all. That implies that it wasn't, and they weren't. But we should. We've got the greatest gift ever given. This this, uh, country will pause next Sunday. And and we'll reflect on the greatest event of all time, the foundation of our faith, resurrection. Now, Now we rejoice in that every Lord's Day. But I'm thankful that the world will pause. And I'm thankful that they will be thinking about resurrection. It's the greatest thing that's ever happened. That is a reason and cause for rejoicing. Rejoice in godliness. Rejoice in truth. Rejoice like God, uh, Luke 15, in someone who comes back to the Father, who's been away and wants to have their sins forgiven. Rejoice in righteousness. Where are you at this moment? What do you embrace more than anything else? What do you talk about and rejoice in? In God? In the good things that's happening among His people? In truth? In righteousness? Or do you find that maybe your life is more connected to things that are not consistent with the way of God's people and with the love of Christ and with the purity that comes through the truth? And whatever your lifestyle might be, I hope that as you start to look and as you start to introspectively consider your own life and your sins, I hope that you're willing to to make them right. Do you realize that God went through so much to allow us to have a relationship with Him. If we thought that it was a big thing for Him to bring, his, bring those people out of Egypt, if we thought it was a big thing for Him to part the Red Sea and, and for God's people to walk across in freedom, if we thought that was big, the cross is bigger. God has done more for us than we can realize. You, you remember in Exodus 32 when the people who didn't come to uh, Moses' side and and, and they stood firm in their their stubbornness. You you know what happened to those people? God consumed them. They died, 3,000 of them, uh, around the time of Pentecost. We know much later an event that happened right at Pentecost where 3,000 people died, but not physically like those in Exodus 32, but 3,000 people died because they said, we see that God has done so much more for us at Calvary. 3,000 people died to themselves, but they live through Jesus because they were willing to confess their sins and be immersed to have their sins washed away, forgiven. Where are you this morning? God has done so much, and it's a cause for rejoicing. And if you need to respond to Jesus, we're going to ask you to step out into the aisle, come forward as Perry leads us in this song, and give your life, your heart, and be immersed in the waters of baptism to have your sins washed away. If we can help you in that regard this morning, please come all together. We stand and while we sing. blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come, just as I am. And waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot 
and a prayer. Um, we have two that we want to recognize, two babies. Um, I believe they are both upstairs, and so I'm not going to ask them to come down, but generally uh, our practice here is to pass out a blanket and to say a prayer uh, for those families and their babies and uh, just acknowledge that, that uh, the beauty of this. So uh, Trent and Emily Smith, where are you? I know you're upstairs. They're waving up there and you can't see them. They're, they're looking down on us uh, from up there. Uh, no, but Trent and Emily are in the back. And then also uh, Jacob and Jordan. I think y'all yeah, yeah, are just right together. So that's great. Uh, we're going to say a prayer uh, for uh, Trent and Emily's uh, son, Oliver Trent, and also a prayer uh, in the same prayer, we'll say uh, a blessing for Jacob and Jordan's uh, daughter, Amelia Bryce Saint. So let's bow and go to God in a word of prayer. Father, we are so thankful for your amazing grace. We're thankful that every good gift and every perfect gift comes from you. And there, you are not subject to change. For that, we're grateful. Father, we're thankful that you bless us in this life with so many beautiful and perfect gifts. And we know that one of the many blessings that we receive are our children. We do ask, Father, that you would bless Trent and Emily to continue to raise their family, continue to do what they can to help uh, Oliver to learn about your son Jesus, to know about the goodness and grace that you offer through Jesus, your son. I, I pray, Father, for... Uh, Jacob and Jordan, and also for their daughter, Amelia. And I just pray that they too will continue to uh, help Amelia to grow up and develop a strong faith uh, that will be a blessing for many. Father, we are so thankful for our children. We're thankful for the good blessings you've given to us as a spiritual family here at Washington Street. We are mindful, Father, that today you've given us a gift and tomorrow we must return that gift prepared for eternity. Father, we ask that you would help us as a church family to embrace and help Oliver and Amelia to develop that great faith and to change many lives. Help us to understand our responsibility and to do everything that we can uh, to be the best examples of faith before them. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Sweet. 
babies, sweet babies. Charles, I used to throw the blankets to the balcony if, uh, if you want to go ahead and... <laughs> I'm just teasing. Oh, thank you for the, for the encouragement of your presence this morning. And uh, it is good to be together. There's just a, a few folks on our prayer list. I would point you to our bulletin this morning with a good, many number, a good number of names, uh, folks in need of prayer. But there are a few uh, here this week, special, that we want to, uh, to highlight and make you aware of. Prayer has been requested for Jimmy Cox. He is at home recovering following a couple of small strokes uh, this past week. He is doing well. And... Uh, um, JB says, as stubborn as always, uh, but we pray for Jimmy and uh, Donna. We rejoice, uh, well, let me also mention Miss Ann Bedingfield is to have surgery uh, in Franklin this week, so keep her and Sam in your prayers as they deal with that this week. And also we rejoice in the baptism of Alden Golden this past Sunday evening, last week. Alden's a son of Ken and Chris Golden, and we welcome Alden into the family. Is Alden here this morning? Let's see. Yeah. Stand up if you don't mind. Yeah. So everybody, everybody knows Alden. We've watched him grow up and proud of this young man. Thank you. Let's, let's go to God in prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you for the blessing, uh, the blessings that you give us. Father, we're thankful for the blessing of fellowship and the encouragement that uh, each one is to one another in this family. Father, we're thankful for um, we're thankful for the gift of your son. We're thankful for that day that he rode into town on the foal of a donkey, uh, knowing what lay ahead for him. We are thankful that he um, pressed on anyway, and Father, that he went to that cross for us. Father, we praise you for resurrection, and as we think about that and the victory over sin, we are mindful of our own shortcomings, of our own sin, and we bring that, we bring that sin to you, and we ask your forgiveness. Um, Father, we, we lift up our members of our family this morning who are hurting, who are in need of uh, uh, healing and their health. Father, we pray for Jimmy Cox and Donna, we pray for healing, continued healing upon him. Father, we pray that you be with Ann this week as she undergoes surgery, and Sam as he cares for her. Father, we rejoice in the baptism of Alden, and we just uh, pray that you would continue to bless him, and allow us to be good big brothers and big sisters to him as he grows in the Lord. And Father, we're thankful as Charles mentioned, for these babies that are indeed a blessing from you. And we pray that we can be an encouragement to their parents to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord as you instruct us. Father, we are so thankful to be called your children. And uh, we praise you. We thank you. We pray all these things in the name of your Son. Amen. <laughs> 